Good afternoon, everybody. We are between you and the lunch, which is a very dangerous uh, time to present, but so we'll try and keep it uh, short and crisp. Uh, just to introduce, uh, I think I'm pretty new to this kind of forum. So I'm Ketan Chitnis, work with UNICEF in the program division, focusing on what Carlos was referring to, uh, work around communi uh, community engagement, risk communication, behavior change aspects. Uh, and I support a range of health programs, uh, not just um, uh, outbreaks or, or cholera. So um, routine programming for maternal and newborn child health and the behavioral aspects related to that in terms of key family practices, uh, as well as uh, support to outbreaks, particularly the large ones like Ebola, cholera, and so forth. Uh, and we'll be co-presenting with Eva, so she'll introduce herself uh, in a minute. Uh, so we are excited, I think, about this uh, slot and I think today was a much better day in terms of the, the reference that was being made to behavioral challenges in the household, aspects related to community demand, both including for your advocacy efforts. So I think uh, it's quite clear that the, the, the GTFCC kind of approach is looking at uh, you know role of communities across all these spectrums uh, quite closely. And it's a good opportunity for us to then explore further how we can contribute to the different uh, pillars. Um, so just as a, taking a couple of steps back, I think the, the focus on uh, a field which is called sometimes only community engagement, sometimes referred to as uh, risk communication, behavior change, and community engagement has become quite central, uh, particularly post uh, Ebola uh, in, in recent times, the West Africa Ebola outbreak 2014-15, where a lot of reviews really uh, came to the point that engaging communities, you know, promoting community ownership is critical and, and tailoring the response within the social cultural context is extremely uh, kind of important. And within that spirit of those lessons, which were shared at the highest level at the UN uh, as part of the Global Health Securities Task Force, I think that the SG had convened, uh, there were a number of recommendations that came out. And since then, some of the global partners, so UNICEF closely with WHO, IFRC uh, and, and implementing agencies like Oxfam and others, as well as donors like USAID, uh, DFID to a certain extent, uh, Wellcome Trust and others, um, you know, have been having a lot of uh, kind of intense discussions and actions with regards to ensuring that there is greater interagency kind of work happening on at this level. Uh, the other big piece out of that work was uh, a big focus, which is the second bullet point on uh, the anthropological and the cultural data that uh, we really need to uh, essentially supplement and, and, and work hand in glove with the epi data. So uh, I think that's, in my view, still an emerging field. Uh, a lot of the data which happens both for, I think, preparedness, but particularly for response, I think is very much focused on, you know, cases where the hotspots are, you know, the line listings and so on. Uh, but the social data, uh, it kind of lacks in terms of, uh, of, of how should we kind of tailor our, our uh, you know, engagement and, and messaging and behavior change programs based on where uh, there are specific needs uh, looking at those social cultural practices. So we are still doing a lot of blanket communication approaches and I think that needs to change. I and mean, that's, that's really the key, key recommendation out of using this social data. Communities are very specific, you know, they're within communities there are, you know, mini communities and, and all of that. So we all know about that, but I think the use of that data is, is not very well articulated. So we've been, for Yemen, cholera, for instance, there's been a lot of push uh, to move the third party monitoring from process related monitoring that's happening in terms of, you know, teams visiting households and spending, num you know, X number of minutes uh, educating the, the household about you know, hygiene practices and so on. Uh, but it, there was no data in terms of what are the behavioral changes that are actually happening or not happening as a result of that. So we've kind of been trying to get into that uh, piece of work uh, and also ensuring that uh, messages need to be tailored to the context or, you know, the whole communication. So a lot of times it's like use latrines, but then when you're promoting use of latrines, uh, again, this was in Yemen, where the coverage uh, in certain areas, uh, there was very high ODF rates. Uh, so if open defecation is, is quite predominant, and clearly those messages are, are, felt, are essentially falling on deaf ears because that's not a practice that those communities are used to. So, you know, that's the kind of nuance that we are looking into. 
uh, and the other pieces are, I think, more in terms of, of uh, refining the strategy, which kind of goes with the data, and then having capacities, uh, including you know, uh, ensuring that there are rosters through which we can draw upon people who can go and support, which is another challenge. Uh, right now, we are facing that in the West Africa, in the DRC, North Kivu Ebola outbreak, for instance, finding it very difficult to get uh, francophone you know, uh, risk communicators and social scientists to go and support that response. Uh, so this is kind of a, a summary of the redefined kind of risk communication, community engagement, interagency, strategic areas that we want to look into for different uh, diseases, the different pathogens. <coughs> we've been doing similar things for, for Ebola, we've done it for Zika, um, and for cholera, it's, I think it was al also presented that it, it's very critical. Uh, I think there are two boxes to, the, to your right, which are talking about hygiene practices and, say, uptake of vaccines and care seeking when it comes to treatment seeking. I think these are the traditional areas where there's been a lot of focus of communication behavior change activities, you know, done through, uh, you know, KAP studies to understand what people know, don't know, the behavioral drivers, uh, and then tailoring messages, essentially, which could be done through media, interpersonal <coughs> communication, social mobilization, and so on. But outside of those two boxes, which need to be done better based on, on, on social data, I think as we've been discussing yesterday and today, I think there is a greater role of communities across the other pillars as well, which I think this is where we still need to unpack and work very closely between the communication and community engagement expertise and the expertise from surveillance, epidemiology, you know, case management, and so on. Uh, so role of communities in, in terms of surveillance, what it is, exactly how do we kind of bring certain community leaders in, as part of the community-based surveillance network, for instance, community alerts, what kind of training do you need to give to them, and so forth. Uh, likewise, I think uh, preparedness work uh, and cross, I mean, during an outbreak, there's a lot of cross-border preparedness work that happens, but given the elimination plan is really about endemic countries and, and need to work as part of overall kind of WASH uh, programming and ensuring that we are trying to avert uh, uh, cholera. Um, I think there still we need to considerably, I think, uh, be thinking differently than the way we have been approaching as part of uh, risk communication for an outbreak response, the way we do it for polio, for instance, for a number of years, right, going in and trying to get polio vaccine to be accepted among communities. I think that's a bit different than working really on, on preparedness. And again, there's a lot of evidence uh, on behavior change as well as community engagement in, the, in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, community-based programs and community health uh, as part of, say, community-based primary health care, maybe we can draw upon that as part of the preparedness work. And I think that's what we are trying to now move towards. Um, I think uh, a good example was probably presented in terms of uh, this whole issue of rapid response teams. I think Haiti has been trying that, uh, Yemen as well. Again, there is a particular role uh, of engaging communities as opposed to just giving education sessions over there. So again, we need to maybe just retweak what we have been doing, and that's part of this kind of redefinition of the strategy. Uh, security and access is maybe not that relevant, maybe in cholera, but we've seen that right now, for instance, there's a lot of community anger, community resistance, attacks on, on response teams when it comes to a res, you know, an outbreak response like Ebola, because the, the building of trust with the communities has been uh, maybe not such a big uh, focus. And, uh, and the point being that as part of the response, there are multiple um, response actors across different pillars who are actually engaging with the communities. It's not only the community mobilizers or the outreach workers. Uh, or the frontline workers, you know, it could be the ones who are doing uh, contact tracing, the ones who are doing surveillance, who are actually engaging with the communities first. And if that interaction goes sour, then there's issues in terms of the trust that we have with the communities. Uh, in terms of outcomes, we want to kind of move in the direction of um, measuring outcomes also more, um, I think, uh, um, uh, you know, more robustly in terms of the contribution of this area towards prevention and uh, towards ending transmission if there's an outbreak, for instance. So behavior change focus as you know, by using uh, a lot of the communication, risk communication tools. Uh, I think the behaviors are known, hand washing, 
you know, water treatment, food handling, uh, you know, and if uh, there is uh, suspected symptoms and care seeking. So we know what behaviors we want communities to practice, but those behaviors, uh, you know, uh, on the one hand, don't need to be blanket. Second, I think the balance between top-down biomedical approaches over what the community context is and getting communities to be engaged in that, I think that's the dilemma that one is facing. So it's not that we don't know what to communicate, we know that very well, uh, but then uh, people are not able to follow up upon those uh, and that advice, and there's a reason for that. And then again, we can go back to a lot of the uh, participatory and the community-based approaches to maybe merge the two. Uh, I think there's also a role for communication in terms of the provider behavior change and the interpersonal skills that happen at the facility level, for instance. Uh, that's a work where WHO actually has been focusing quite a bit. Um, and so that's, again, an, a piece where we need to probably uh, focus a bit more, not just looking at communicating with communities, but also ensuring that there is communication skills with the different uh, frontline workers and providers. Uh, the community feedback and accountability mechanisms, I think those are critical uh, as part of the humanitarian kind of um, commitments that we have done, uh, you know, ensuring that there is accountability uh, of our response back to the communities. Uh, are we listening to the feedback, taking it back into account as part of the uh, planning and programming? Uh, I know how much of community ownership are we actually able to build in to the interventions and, and using that as the accountability framework. So again, um, in Yemen, uh, pre I think cholera outbreak as part of the uh, insecurity, there were a lot of uh, accountability surveys done and uh, uh, the, the results were not very promising essentially. They were not seeing the humanitarian response to be meeting the needs of the communities that, that, was, uh, that it was targeting. So those pieces need to be taken into account as well as uh, for cholera. Uh, community participation and ownership, I think, is another outcome that we need to look into, which cuts across, I think, all of these. Uh, and it kind of is also linked to accountability. Uh, and some of it comes back from, I think, feedback data that Eva will speak about in a moment. Uh, lastly, I think uh, public communication and advocacy is also important. It's also about the perceptions that people have. So risk communication is about elevating risk-related uh, re issues and perceptions among the, uh, among the communities and creating a kind of an enabling environment. So you know, needing to get some outcomes related to that. Uh, just as a quick example, I think uh, this is borrowed from uh, the MENA uh, or EMRO cholera uh, regional platform that's being set up. And the idea over here was really trying to see how across the different uh, pillars from WASH issues, the, the, the healthcare aspects, the surveillance, uh, the coordination pieces, there is a different, uh, I think, expectations and outcomes uh, that are needed uh, with regards to uh, the social science and the, and the risk communication community engagement expertise. So looking at the behavioral drivers and the hygiene aspects, right from risk assessment, uh, to ensuring the role of communities and, and accountability in the kind of the coordination pieces, uh, to patient feedback, whether the services are, are, are uh, meeting their needs, uh, and you know, all the way down in terms of uh, community ownership and so on. So I think it's a good way for us to think about this area, whether, you know, first of all in the NCPs to have uh, at least a, a dedicated um, you know, set of results with regards to this and then to determine how do we uh, uh, position it as part of these different pillars? So I'll now hand over to Eva for the next session uh, of this presentation. Yeah, we're running a little bit out of time. Um, so a few examples about how community engagement could look like in cholera response, prevention, um, preparedness as well, um, vital disease outbreaks. Um, first one is Yemen. We have been talking a lot about it. Um, our team is now, like this year, adapting our approach to cholera response and preparedness based on previous learning from uh, disease outbreaks and um, our work in the cholera response in Yemen. And uh, so we are thinking about like implementing a classification system and primarily focusing on inactive areas. So for us, inactive areas are um, previously endemic ones, um, those which are high risk but not having had, um, had cases in the past but not um, for the time being. And the objective is really here to strengthen our community level um, capacity to um, undertake preparedness planning. 
Um, and this is like critical because a lot of those uh, locations are inaccessible or very remote and it takes like for any response team far too much time to actually get there. So community are first line responders. Um, so this means proactively we invest in a contextual analysis, so health seeking behavior, informal, formal um, community leadership structures, socio-cultural perceptions, for example, in terms of chlorinated water. Um, it also means that we get um, community focal points in safe locations, training them in advance and then also equipping them with material. And then um, looking at really facilitating local level preparedness planning with community level stakeholders and other response actors. And that doesn't mean at, similar to what you have been describing in Haiti, that doesn't mean like at village level, but really like more at a meso level. Um, <clears throat> And then also the uh, more systematic use of mobile technology. So in the past 2016-17, we have been using WhatsApp uh, with uh, community health workers to get like updates on the health situation, uh, but also then to answer um, questions because we couldn't like um, really access them on a regular basis. Um, I think now um, the teams and with the clusters are thinking about introducing a web-based uh, reporting system, so using an app to facilitate referrals, contact tracing, and a faster response. Um, second one, talking about mobile technology, this is like um, from our very recent work in an ongoing work in the Ebola response in the DRC. And this is like part of our wider um, project where we measure community participation in WASH to understand the effectiveness of community engagement. So really looking at our capacity to adapt WASH programming based on community feedback. So um, here, like the teams are using a feedback app um, to capture more systematically qualitative information about like beliefs, rumors, perceptions people have in um, with regards to the disease, but also to the vital response um, system. And um, once back in the office, once connected, this um, information is uploaded in a database which has like different categories. So it's very easy then to generate reports and then to understand like um, specific barriers um, per location, per age or gender group. So this could mean that, for example, um, women um, have a lot of... Um, reservations about like treatment centers because they're not convinced about um, the quality of care for young children and therefore would rather seek um, private uh, health care. It could also mean that um, we see that male youth think that vaccination would kill um, and so therefore refusing the access of vaccination teams in their communities. So this information is used to really like do real-time analysis with our teams because a lot of times they're collecting a lot of information but they don't really understand why and we don't use that information. And then to adapt our program on an ongoing basis and then secondly also to inform um, other response actors and the external coordination to hopefully then influence um, the steer of the response. So really the advocacy part in it. <clears throat> ah, challenges. Um, so we have heard uh, uh, already about uh, quite some challenges and also this morning we have discussed the issue of like accessing timely and accurate um, health data to then use it to inform our response and also like the community-centered uh, approach. Um, we have, um, we, we kind of like a quite focused on the collection of quantitative information um, and we need to have like a greater, um, we need to prioritize more the qualitative aspects, but then also not only retrieving information from the communities, also get back to them at time with the accurate information they need and also then making adaptations based on their feedback, um, based on, on their rec recommendations. And I think that is like not only a challenge in cholera um, responses or preparedness, but also in, in vital humanitarian work. And I'm... Okay, um, then um, that the third point comes back to uh, coordination and capacity in the sector as such. Um, there are de very different understanding of what community engagement means. Again, like in the Ebola response, we see a, a very much top-down approach um, <clears throat> by many actors. And um, not a lot of like really um, technical capacity on the ground to implement like more community-centered ways of working. Um, there's a confusion about the roles of communities across all pillars. So surveillance is working with communities. Um, we have the vaccination teams working with communities, we have hygiene promotion working with communities, and communities themselves get also confused. Um, moving out of our comfort zone, um, so it does also require um, from ourselves a behavior change. Um, 
community engagement is not astrophysics, yeah, um, and but it does like require greater investment in human resources, in technical support, um, like stepping away a little bit from this message dissemination, distribution of kit, but really fostering bottom-up approaches and community found solutions. Thanks, Eva. So this is our last slide, uh, and this is just to give you a, a kind of a, a piece cursor. Some of you will be in a meeting tomorrow, I think, in the afternoon, which uh, Monica has kindly and Kate have kindly organized. Uh, so essentially, I, as I said, this area of work, I think, has been mainstreamed, and but hasn't been probably uh, discussed in depth as part of uh, the overall GTFCC work, uh, though it's very critical when it comes to, to rolling out uh, strategies. So uh, I think tomorrow afternoon we are going to have a discussion uh, with regards to, uh, I think, you know, how does this, this area of work fit? Uh, I think in, as part of the NCPs, if it's a pillar, it would be helpful so that we can get adequate, I think, attention, resources, and uh, uh, ways for us to actually uh, do higher quality community engagement work. Uh, that, again, as I said, there have been quite a few challenges otherwise. Uh, it'll also allow coordination, capacity building work, you know, dedicated funding or fundraising that'll go with that. And uh, we would push for actually, you know, the, the social data to go with epi data. So essentially do be more, more data driven and focused on, on outcomes that uh, the community engagement and the risk communication work will contribute towards uh, prevention of cholera. Uh, so we'll discuss this tomorrow, uh, and I think it's already in the field guide, for instance, uh, a section on this, uh, so that's going to help us move this forward. Uh, and as part of the uh, framework or the cookbook that's being uh, developed, I think we need to then identify, based on this discussion, what would be the specific guidance that would be needed uh, that will then help the NCPs. Over. Okay. Uh, a really great round of applause for them finishing so far.